Apparently, we're recording. Um, for blue sheets, uh, we did not actually set up a hedge doc for that. That was a bit of an oversight, but I'll do that right now, real quick. There's one there. Is there? Yeah. Francesco right. was the only one on it um, in the agenda. There was a link, and I clicked on it, and. Uh, oh, there, you're absolutely right. I was looking the wrong section. The classic Martin Thompson, you've missed something obvious tone. Um, so yeah, there is a, a link for the blue sheets uh, in, in the first section there under Administrivio, right here. And people are filling that, that out. That's great. So uh, we've got blue sheets, uh, scribe selection we've done. Note well. Uh, if folks aren't familiar with this, please do familiarize yourself with it. This is the note well. You can find it by searching your favorite internet search engine for IETF note well. And it is a list of the policies that we operate under, including things like harassment, code of conduct, copyrights, intellectual property, patents, and other things. Uh, so if, again, if you're not familiar with that, please do familiarize yourself with it because it does uh, apply to everyone who participates here. Uh, today, uh, we just have discussion of three of the active extension drafts. Uh, signatures, digest, and cookies, and then in two days' time, depending on where you're at, either on Tuesday or sorry, on Thursday or Friday, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the remaining four active drafts: alternative services, client cert headers, uh, query method, and the newer binary representation of HTTP messages. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we're going to have a brief discussion of two proposals: uh, Tommy's GeoHash client int, and my retrofit of structured headers. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, does anybody have any agenda bashing? I have a small request um, mm -hmm. that that people stop checking in stuff that makes the extensions repository not build. Mm -hmm. um, it's getting a little tiresome and fixing it. Fair enough. But, I, I think that repo will be a lot easier pretty soon when we uh, we're about to ship a bunch of documents and that'll make it a lot smaller, at least in its in its head state. So hopefully that'll help. Any agenda bashing? Okay. And I see from Julian in chat, congratulations to the H2 authors for IES, IESG approval. Indeed, uh, that, that's a, a great milestone. We now have all of the various documents describing HP Core and the different versions in the RFC editor queue, which is great. Okay, so let's kick off with signatures. We've scheduled 35 minutes for each of these. We'll see how we do with time. Um, it's Austin, time. yeah, uh, take it away. And let me, sorry, adjust this. All right, fantastic. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, so go ahead, next slide. Hi, everybody. I am Justin Richer presenting HTTP message signatures. And I'm not gonna go into uh, great detail today about the mechanics of how all of this works because we've presented this a few times now if you want to know more about how it works uh there are some resources that i'm going to point everybody at including of course the draft itself um but in a nutshell it is a detached signature mechanism uh for generic http messages uh something that'll work well for requests and responses and it works more or less with a couple of caveats across different http versions uh as well because we're trying to wherever possible, bind to semantics and bind to sort of proper HTTP definitions and terminology, or at least as proper as HTTP can ever get. Um, one of the biggest things about this uh, mechanism is that it needs to be robust against the kinds of changes that you expect to see in an HTTP-based system. So you hit a proxy and it injects its own header field, or it, uh, it changes the, um, the authority or something like that. And we do this by allowing applications to select and partially sign what they know to be the stable aspects of the message, the parts that are relevant to the application in question. We've got a lot of text uh, in there about how you select that and why it's important to select that, uh, that set of uh, components to sign. Um, another thing that this allows is uh, multiple signatures, in, uh, which again includes uh, things like proxying and reverse proxying, where the intermediaries can actually add their own signatures on top of the message over time to sign the bits that they see 
uh, and pass that along in the system. Um, and finally, we use uh, HTTP uh, native stuff, unlike some other signature mechanisms uh, that have come uh, that have come along in the past. Some of which I have uh, uh, sadly invented um, in the past. Uh, we're using structured fields um, and in a lot of different ways to define uh, how all this stuff works. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, I think. Oh, there we go. Um, so this this happens in three parts. You take your HTTP message, and you figure out which parts of it that you want to sign, and that gets transformed into this signature input string. So this is a canonicalization scheme for HTTP messages, where you say, "I'm going to sign these bits." Some of them are the header fields from the message itself. Some of them are derived from the context of the message. Uh, so in this example, uh, you can see the fifth line down in the middle box, you see the target URI of the HTTP message. That's known from the context of the HTTP message uh, by both the signer and the verifier of this. Um, and then all of that gets chunked through uh, pretty much an, you know, your, your choice of off-the-shelf crypto, crypto algorithm to give you the signature, which is then uh, packed into the HTTP message that you're trying to sign. And as a reminder, again, this um, applies to both uh, headers, uh, sorry, in both requests and responses. Uh, next slide, please. So the HTTP signing process, you take in the message that you're trying to sign, the key material you're gonna use to sign it, and the set of required components. Um, and you're going to apply this canonicalization algorithm to create the signature input message, uh, which you then apply a cryptographic primitive to. Now, depending on the nature of the cryptographic primitives that you're using, there could be key derivation, there could be um, message hashing, and uh, I'm realizing just now that I mean message, message hashing in the security and crypto sense, and I mean message in the security and crypto sense and not in the HTTP sense, so sorry about the overloaded term there. Um, and uh, binary encoding of various gigantic integers, which you see a lot of in uh, cryptographic spaces. And the output of this is the signature itself and a set of signature parameters that the verifier can then use to validate the message. Those get sent side by side as a pair of headers. Next slide, please. Uh, and are inputs into the verification process. So fundamentally, the HTTP message has this signature and parameters in the message itself. Uh, so you extract those along with and take those along with the HTTP message and the key that you're going to use to verify this in order to compute uh, the verification output. Um, again, we defined a bunch of uh, cryptographic primitives that you can use to run on the, all of this input, um, and the output is whether the signature verified or not, given the context that you were handed in. One of the most important things about this is that the signer and verifier have to derive the same input string to the crypto uh, algorithms on both ends. And that feature is what makes uh, HTTP message signatures robust in uh, the types of environments that we find HTTP uh, living in. It's not an encapsulation system. Those have their place. Uh, this is for, uh, for all of the spaces out there where encapsulation is not a good fit, which is quite a lot of them. Uh, next slide, please. So we just published draft eight uh, a couple of days ago. Um, I've already found a couple of bugs in eight, so there will probably be draft nine next week as soon as I can uh, get the bandwidth to, to verify the examples. Uh, but the biggest changes from when we last met at IETF 112 is that uh, the editors went and added the security and privacy considerations to the document, which as you would imagine with a document like this is fairly extensive. Um, we, our goal is to be as comprehensive as possible. So uh, please, everybody, take a look at those. And um, you know, if there's an aspect of this that we missed, um, then you know, please let us know. Please uh, suggest new text to go in there. Uh, we've also taken and rewritten um, various editorial pieces of this that described how the process works and how it's applied. Uh, so we actually haven't changed the signature functions at all, but we've changed how we how we talk about how you're supposed to use the signatures. 
Uh, so for a very small example, we now talk about the list of required covered components being one of the inputs to the whole signing process. Whereas previously it was implied and ultimately needed, but we never actually called that out. Um, we've updated and rerun all of the examples. I've actually rewritten my example generation script, which is also linked from the uh, HTTP extensions repository. It's not in the repo, it's, it's, it's in its own repo, but that script is linked uh, from one of the issues in the repository. Um, we updated uh, several of the crypto primitives, which I'm gonna talk about uh, those in just a sec. I added a bunch of ABNFs uh, for the different parts of the uh, of the process. I think they're correct. I'm not an ABNF expert. Would love to have more eyes on those. Um, and probably the biggest change in terminology was that uh, we dropped the really dumb name of specialty components to derived components, which I am much happier about. Um, uh, because the whole idea is that you're pulling stuff from the message and you're deriving it from the message. So things like the verb, things like the target URI, all of that is derived from the message and its context. Uh, next slide, please. So um, three bits on the cryptographic primitive stuff. First, we now have definitions for ED25519. I did a lot of digging into, uh, into the Edwards curve crypto space to try and figure out what the heck you're supposed to do uh, with this set of uh, set of primitives. And we have settled on using a pure EDDSA with no prehash on the message um, with the 25519 curve and, um, and no context flag, uh, if you really want to get into the gritty details of that. Um, we also uh, got some, uh, so that's in there now. If you're interested in using ED25519, please take a look at the text to make sure it actually makes sense for your implementation. I implemented it, hopefully it, it works. Um, we also got feedback from an implementer uh, about our ECDSA signature encoding, um, because as it turns out, um, the what I thought was the obvious and correct way to do the encoding, which was also uh, how a number of other people had done it, uh, was not the only way that you, could, that you are allowed to encode in uh, a DSA signature. So uh, we're more explicit about that now, and uh, there was a short discussion on the list about uh, about people's preferences uh, to not drag ASN1 into this as a dependency. Um, and finally, uh, since a lot of people, uh, a small handful of people were confused about uh, the nature of non-deterministic non algorithms, um, so RSA, PSS, and ECDSA do not have deterministic output, which means that if you sign the same message multiple times, you're going to get a different output. So people were trying to test the test vectors by signing it again, and they were getting a different signature value thinking that they had done something wrong, whereas that's actually just expected with these particular algorithms. Um, so, so Justin. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but um, there's, a, there's a discussion running on the CFRG about deterministic and non-deterministic algorithms. Okay. Um, and it turns out that it may be best practice in the future to have non-determinism in mm -hmm. signature algorithms uh, due to fault injection problems with some of the existing implementations mm -hmm. of the deterministic ones. So I think it's worth pointing out and establishing this. So good. All right. Thank you, Martin. So the the main the main issue that we had with the non-deterministic algorithms were just uh, people that were coming into this without a strong crypto background were surprised that they were getting a different value. Um, whereas even even with RSA 15, you're not supposed to just regenerate the signature. There is an actual verification process that you're supposed to do um, a, a verification function that you're supposed to do with it. Um, so we have now called that out explicitly in all of our internal definitions. And uh, as a reminder, all of the algorithms that are defined in the spec itself are, uh, in addition to being usable on their own right, they're meant to act as templates for people who are wanting to define and use their own algorithms. Uh, so say you've got your own crypto stack with your own key exchange that you want to do, you should be able to use HTTP signatures with that. You should be clear how that plugs in and what you need to define in order to make that work. Uh, this is gonna be true both with uh, you know, registered public extensions and if somebody's just using this on a LAN somewhere with their own weird in-house crypto. Um, 
Not that I'm recommending anybody go and invent their own weird in house crypto because that ends poorly. All right. Anyway, the biggest thing that we did there was just point everything out so that people could actually figure figure out what they were doing. Uh, next slide, please. Speaking of implementation, we're actually seeing a fair bit of implementation across different uh, languages and uh, um, and platforms. And uh, th not all of this is from me. <laughs> um, I'm very, very happy to say. Uh, so the first two implementations up there, the Java and the Python, are ones that I've uh, that I've done. Uh, the first is part of the XYZ implementation of GNAP. And uh, so we'll actually be using that at the IETF 113 hackathon that uh, GNAP has been um, uh, submitted into. Um, but then there's also a Python implementation, which uh, is behind the script that generates all of the examples that are in the document, as well as httpsig.org. Uh, now, those of you may remember from, uh, from the last IETF, uh, the editors have gone and set up uh, httpsig.org for you to go and play with uh, HTTP message signatures. Um, and uh, the idea here is that you can paste in any valid, hopefully any valid HTTP message and your own key material and step through the process of signing and verifying a, uh, an HTTP signature. Um, and I'll step through what that looks like uh, at the end of the presentation. But we've got uh, Scala code, we've got uh, some JavaScript code. We've got a Rust library um, that's a, an update of a uh, of an old Cabbage implementation, um, and we've got a Go library that's been written from scratch, uh, from as as far as I'm aware, by Yaron Sheffer. Um, so really, really cool stuff, and I think we're going to see uh, more of this as we go. I'm also hoping that the uh, that the GNAP hackathon is going to start to drag more of this, uh, you know, more implementations of platforms and support out, out of the works. Uh, like, for example, I know that my my Java implementation, I really, really need to do the work to extract that from the GNAP implementation. It's very embedded right now. There's no reason for it not to be a library other than just my own limited time. Um, and uh, my my thought is that we can start to add these to the httpsig.org website as a Here's a list of available implementations um, as they become more stable, as they become more usable, um, to just have a place for people who are looking at message signatures to, to go to pull that information. Uh, next slide, please. So we're going to be talking about digest in a few minutes, um, and these two are two uh, related specs. Um, signatures don't protect the message content. They don't protect the body. Uh, but digest only protects the message content or or the representation, uh, which I think I finally understand the difference. Uh, but it does so by doing a simple hash with no keys, um, which means that uh, an attacker would be able to simply replace the digest and the body at the same time, and it would still validate. Uh, message signatures is designed, however, to wrap directly on top of that uh, so that you create the digest, put that into a header, and then that is going to be uh, covered with the message signature because we can sign any arbitrary field. Um, what this means in some though is that applications of message signatures are likely to need to profile digest as well to say use this particular digest and these algorithms for, uh, for the body and these algorithms and keys for, uh, for the rest of the HTTP message. Uh, so, um, you know, they're not directly dependent on each other in terms of, you know, normative requirements, but for practical purposes, they really, they really are uh, pretty close to each other. And um, we've been trying to, uh, the editors uh, have been uh, chatting with each other about kind of how that actually works and how we can present that. Next slide, please. Um, I still have an open question about how all of this work relates to the signed HTTP exchanges. Um, I don't see... Uh, Jeff on the call here, but um, there is an expired individual draft that was targeted at WPAC uh, that defines its own signature field and its own signature header parameters and things like that. Um, and I don't know if anybody's using that or where that is, but um, what we've been trying to do with message signatures is make sure that everything that's in that draft, all of the good ideas in that draft could be covered 
by uh, message signatures or a simple extension to message signatures that would be specific to WPAC. Um, so we've tried to have the extension points and the functionality in there so that to make that easy. Um, I don't know where that sits right now. I would I would love to. I would love to be able to put a nail in this issue and say, you know, th this is where we stand in relation to that. Um, and I think signatures is, is stable and featureful enough for us to be able to do that. Um, yeah. Justin, go ahead. yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah, we've done some liaison with WPAC and talked to Jeffrey individually in the past. I think it's probably like you say, we're getting towards the end here. Uh, I think the chairs will just go and do another liaison with them and, and maybe we can loop you in and talk to uh, uh, Jeffrey and make sure that at least everybody understands where everything sits. Uh, I, th I think we should be able to close this pretty soon. Perfect. That's 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 great. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there is a, uh, a HTTP signature playground. I mentioned, um, at the beginning of the talk, it is at httpsig.org. And, um, oh, are we going to try a live demo? Um, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Um, this was working a few minutes ago. I already know that there's a bug in it. Uh, so I'll point out the bug as we go by, because I, I'm waiting for, uh, uh, the DevOps folks to uh, redeploy the back end still. Um, so let's try it. So um, if you could please um, click on example request. Uh, so this first page, you load up the HTTP message. Uh, oh yeah, could you bump up the font size? Uh, that is that is actually quite small. Thank you. Um, and you can follow along at home too. Um, so this is just a generic HTTP request. Um, you can go ahead and put whatever uh, HTTP message uh, you want in there. It it is doing an actual uh, perfect. Uh, it is doing an actual uh, parse in the background. So if you hit parse, what this does is that this uh, basically gives you the entire context for what uh, is able to be signed. Um, all right. And now we see the first bug. You see that the host header is is in there twice, uh, as as are a couple of the others. Uh, ignore that. <laughs> That's actually because of the uh, signatures allows you to use what's called the uh, the strict uh, structured field serialization of headers that are known to fit structured field formats, um, uh, and that'll be a topic of uh, of Mark's presentation on Thursday. So we'll we'll loop back around to that and hopefully this will be fixed by then. Uh, but if you want to go ahead and select a uh, a few of those, um, yep, you can select foo. So I will say one of one of the things is that uh, in the back end, we are assuming that everything is over HTTPS. So all URLs are HTTPS and the scheme is always HTTPS for purposes of this demo. So we'll just call it that. Uh, and if you want to go ahead and hit the clock on creation time, uh, it's the first button there. Um, that gives us a current timestamp and, uh, go ahead and generate the signature input. Now, again, this is a live demo, so I don't know how well this is going to work. There we go. Um, so up top, we've now got the signature input string. This, uh, is the canonicalized version of the HTTP message. Uh, you can see it's got all of the things that, um, that Mark checked off on the previous page. Um, and the last line of that input is the parameters of the signature itself. Uh, now we did leave this as an editable field. So at this point you could go and create an invalid signature string and still sign it in case you needed that for some, you know, anti purpose, like you needed to pass an invalid, uh, or a signature on an invalid string to test things or something like that. Um, yeah, so exactly, Martin, Mark, uh, now, uh, you need to paste your own, uh, private key into the bottom, but, uh, no, for real, uh, we've got preloaded a bunch of stuff. So you can use RSA, uh, ECC or ED25519. Um, and those private keys are all checked into GitHub. So please don't use them for any production servers. Uh, not the 1st time I've had to say that about a system. Um, go ahead and scroll down and you can see the rest of the parameters of the signing material. So we're going to do an ED25519 uh, signature, um, and you can uh, choose your own signature label. Every signature in message signatures gets labeled, so you can type that in. Uh, I was trying to have a randomly generated thing, and, 
uh, ready for this uh, for today so people people could play with it. But it completely crashed my JavaScript engine, and I don't know why. So I th that feature got dropped for today. Anyway, if you hit sign signature input down at the bottom here, if the demo gods smile on us, which they're not. Um, I think what you might have to do, I've seen a bug like this with this algorithm. If the drop down signature algorithm, um, I think you need to select a different value and then go back to the ED25519 and then sign it. Try that. I also haven't put in very robust error reporting yet. Um, so let, let's try a different private key. It might be the uh, the ED thing is falling over. Uh, RSA usually works. There we go. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I knew something was gonna break in the live demo, it was going too well. Uh, so this is what the signature output looks like. Uh, the site gives you the raw signature output up in the top, as well as what the message headers would look like that you would add to the original message uh, in order to have a signed message. This whole thing also works with responses. So if up at the top, if you go up to the uh, back up to the input step, um, then uh, then you can select a different response. And there's also a, a flow uh, for um, you can select a different message, uh, and there's also a flow for validating uh, existing signatures. Excuse me. Um, and using the keys that are that are preloaded into this, um, and uh, all right. So to validate a signature, we'll do this real quick. So uh, the first thing that you need to do is you you have to recreate the um, the signature input. So uh, you've got a new drop down box up at the top there that says use parameters from existing signature. So go ahead, do that. It pulls all of the parameters, including the including the key ID. So go ahead, hit signature input. All right, this gives our input materials. So we want to load the RSA public key here. And go ahead and scroll down at the very bottom because there's a verify signature. It's not the best UI. Uh, if anybody can improve that, please do. Um, but we now get the green button up at the top and very confusingly, it doesn't clear out the signature from the last part of the demo. Uh, again, I'm not the world's greatest UI programmer. Um, but all the beats are, uh, uh, you know, all 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 the pieces are there, and um, and it's all up on GitHub. So please help improve this. Um, uh, just if you file an issue to complain about my my React JS code, I'll just close that because I know it's terrible. Um, but other than that, that is HTTP message signatures. Uh, right now we are, uh, and that that's you can go back to the presentation. Um, because uh, that was pretty much the uh, the end of the demo. If you can go all the way to the last slide. See, I had a canned version in case that didn't work. Um, like I mentioned before, it's going to be part of the GNAP hackathon. Um, and the editors think we are approaching workgroup last call uh, at this point. We've got uh, sort of the major parts of the system. It's been stable uh, as, as far as like the normative uh, actual protocol for a while. Uh, it's been stable for a while and uh, people are implementing it. We're seeing both from scratch implementations as well as uh, it, uh, people that are taking various versions of the cabbage, uh, the cabbage draft, and adapting it to the uh, to the new, the working group version, the current draft. Um, and uh, yeah, so let me see. Oh, it will help people. That's great. Um, uh, yeah. So uh, at this point, uh, discussions, questions. That, that's that's all I got. Great. I think we have about nine, ten minutes left on the agenda for this. Um, looks like we're going to go look at the issues. Uh, Lucas, got a question? Uh, um, it's just about digest. I was going to ask this earlier, but um, it wasn't a clarifying question, so I left it. Um, the, the relationship, there's definitely a relationship between signature and digest, but I would expect people to use them together. And it's come up in our draft about whether we should try and talk to that, it you know, in digest. And it sounds like signatures having the conversation in the the opposite direction. Um, I think it would just help to 
maybe try and make a decision amongst us about what is a good barrier like i i push back on putting it in digest because i don't know enough about signature to to say what's good or bad and and maybe this is something that needs to be in neither and in its own document i don't know um yeah as soon as we get into profiling of what algorithms people should use for things i think that that starts to get beyond the remit of a document like digest so i just i just wonder what other people think Yeah, I, I I absolutely agree with the uh, with the notion about profiling and choosing specific um, things. I think it's at the very least both both documents need to be clear about what their limitations are. Um, so the fact that signatures explicitly doesn't cover the uh, the message body um, is you know like people need to know that coming in, and they should be pointed to. Um, a document that will help them do that. So simple recipe kind of thing. Uh, digest, uh, I think, should do a very similar thing in its security considerations that says, like, none of this is keyed. And so if you need key presentation and key coverage, go use signatures or something like it. And I mean, and this would say use Digest or something like it, because I mean, there there are like JSON LD signatures for people that want to go through that madness. There are Jose uh, wrappers that people use for stuff like that. Now, there, there's more than one way to solve this, but there is a very, very clear synergy between these two. Uh, I definitely don't think that uh, that they should be directly profiling each other, um, but I think it, uh, at least the a mention it makes sense, and I would welcome the opportunity to. Uh, for Annabelle and I to work with the uh, digest authors to uh, to get that text aligned uh, within the next couple revisions here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, welcome that. Sounds good. So we could take that offline. Thanks. Sounds good. Um, it does. Lucas's question does raise a um, uh, does raise an interesting question of possibly being uh there possibly being room for a bcp around protecting http messages in general that goes beyond just the mechanics uh i don't know if that's something we can write before like this is widely deployed and we know which parts are broken in in practice but um that might be something to to consider because uh, there's a long history of security BCPs that that pull together multiple drafts like this um, that say, here's how you actually build the thing. Um, okay, so from chat, Martin is taking issue with my choice of variable names, duly noted. Any of the issues that you want to speak to briefly, or is this all just in in train? Um, yeah, let's uh, if you could open up nineteen oh five, so the second one down. Um, this is something that that Yaren rose, uh, and this is this is actually a topic that Annabelle and I had um, had spoken about. So one of the features uh, I would consider one of the more advanced features um, in signatures is the ability to sign things from a request in the context of the response. Um, so the server is basically saying, I am creating this response, but I'm going to say, uh, well, I know that this response is to say a post to a particular URL, or it had this header with this particular value or something like that. So there's, when you're making a response, there is this larger context that includes the request. You don't have that when making the request, obviously, but uh, so we in, we invented this context, uh, this concept called the related response. I don't know if this is a good name for it, or even if this is particularly a good idea. But what it allows you to do is when you're creating a response, say I'm going to sign any or, or a large number of the derived um, uh, content identifiers that are, are only applicable to requests. But as part of my response, and so in that context, the server is saying that, like, you sent me a post message 
So I am going to reply to you and say, I got a post message functionally. Um, there is a related uh, feature that allows you to sign explicitly sign a signature from a request in a response. This is something we pulled from the uh, FAPI working group in uh, the OpenID Foundation, um, to, which is to, and the purpose of it there is to allow you to chain together uh, requests and responses in a way that is cryptographically provable. Um, and so, uh, again, what it amounts to is when the server is creating the response, it goes and pulls the context from the request that is making this response happen and saying, well, you have a signature in that request. I'm going to sign that signature value and uh, add that to my block of signed content. So that's the uh, request response derived value. So Yarn's question is if we need any of this related response stuff to, to begin with, since it could ostensibly be covered with the request response. My question to the larger group is that plus do we need this related response stuff at all? To me, it's kind of in there as it makes sense. It's kind of a nice to have, but it's also something that is a little difficult to explain and wrap your head around. It, the draft would definitely be simpler if we just said, uh, for example, at method is only for requests. And if it shows up when you're signing a response, that's just an error and you just throw it out. Right? Uh, signing the, uh, doing the uh, request response where you're signing the signature of the original, that makes sense to me. That's a feature that I think really should stay, but it's sort of this wider feature should that happen. We did go down the road where you see Yarn mentioning at the very bottom here of having just a generic at related where you then just specify uh, you know, the header field or the derived value or something like that uh, as a set of parameters to that. Annabelle and I looked into that. The syntax and uh, semantics of that were, they explode very, very fast. Um, because now you have to have strings that have quoted values inside of them. And yes, there are ways to do that with structured fields and all, but it, it gets very messy very quickly uh, in order for this to be deterministic and non-ambiguous, which are two things that you absolutely have to have in a signature algorithm, uh, especially in the input generation part of the signature algorithm. So we opted not to do that and, and instead to have this sort of limited middle ground of this uh, derived um, related response values thing. Um, so my question uh, to the group is, where should we land in that? Should we get rid of them all together? Do we stay in this middle bit or do we try to go all the way and have it be anything referenceable? I'm not sure. All right, um, just as a time check, essentially out of time, but let's get this issue discussion done. Mark, you queued. So I need to get to up to speed on on this issue, but just from what I've heard, you know, I, I'm immediately taken to the, to how you calculate a cache key. This is a concept that comes often quite often where you're referring to different portions of the request in the cache key, and we've had the previous work on key and variance, as well as, of course, vary. And, and it seems to me that, you know, that ability to state, you know, this response is within that context or it's usable for this kind of request is, is going to be important to some people. So I, I wouldn't just discard it, but but I'm, I'm happy to go and dig around a little bit more and understand this in more context. Just wanted to flag that. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Martin? I was just gonna say, um, similar to Mark, there's, there's things in responses that don't make sense without the request. Uh, Mark immediately went to the cache. I was thinking about things like head, where um, the the content length of the response is um, doesn't relate to the content length of the body of the message. It's like there's weird stuff in the protocol that simply doesn't make any sense if you don't have the context of the request. Um, it almost seems to me like you can't do some some of the things you might want to do in a in a properly generic signature 
setting without having essentially arbitrary content from the request. And that is challenging within your canonicalization scheme. Um, maybe there's another character you can use to, to identify fields from the request, and then you can go off and define some, some new at symbols or some other one. Um, but yeah, I don't think, I don't think this is complete without this. Um, I'm not sure about the framing of this as a related response. Um, that, yeah. that's, that's, that sort of threw me at first, but I, I, I think the problem as, as explained is, is important to solve. All right. Thank you both for that feedback. Uh, then, um, we'll take that into advisement and. And yeah, so I, so to be fair, I did ask the mailing list about this name a while ago and nobody said anything. So this is what y'all get. I'm terrible at naming things. Uh, so, you know, please help us figure out what this feature should be and, um, and what we actually want to do. Uh, we do want to keep it within, uh, Annabelle's mentioning in the chat. We do want to keep it within the, the structured field, um, sort of uh, syntax, uh, however we uh, end up expressing this. Um, so we'll figure, we'll have to figure out how all of that fits together. Oh, uh, I know we're about out of time, but Annabelle uh, co-editor is on the queue. So I think we should. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on that. I, I, I think um, if there's a need for a more generic uh, way to explicitly include elements from the request in the in this response signature or I, I think we can do that i think there's syntactic tools that we we have in structured fields to do that in a way that is uh reasonable and and sensible um i'm not sure that we need to do it i'm interested in and you know thinking more on that and hearing more from martin on that at some point possibly but um i if there's a if there's a use case for it i don't think we, I, I think that's something that could be included. Yeah. All right. Okay, great. great. Thank you, Justin it. and Annabelle. That was, that was great. And on time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's move on. We're switching over our scribe now, I think to Justin, is that correct? Uh, uh yeah, we, I'm just pulling it up now. So I'm thank good. you so much. Uh, so that's here, and it is indeed full of notes. Thank you so much, Lucas, and people who helped him. Uh, Hedgedoc, if, uh, just a reminder, if you haven't already, uh, we have about half the people on the list. Please add yourself to the uh, blue sheet, which is not blue. Um, next up, we've got Digest. Lucas, take it away. Uh, digest. Um... So yes, this is uh, a classic slide, which is digest fields, which was digest headers, which was resource digest, which all, all goes back to RFC 3230, um, which, you know, effectively what we're trying to do is, is just update a document to make it more consistent with, uh, you know, HB core and, and all our wonderful aligned documents that are about to be published as RFCs. Um, but, uh, we're close. We're close to getting things done, but um, we've had a, a slight, I don't know, a diversion of attention, say, during working group last call. And so these slides are going to focus on just trying to, to resolve that or at least get a clear direction of what we should do so that we can go away and work on it and um, hopefully you know, get this thing out of the working group um, and onto the, onto the RFC editor queue. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we, we, since our interim in September, we had the working group last call for the document. Uh, we didn't get like a huge, uh, amount of like broad review, but what we did get was some deep feedback from a few people, which was really useful. Um, we, we did try to address most of this, um, because it was all good suggestions or at least identifying things that could have been improved upon. And then edit, as editors, we've gone a fix that um but kind of part way through that um we had this this curveball about considerations for structured fields so um if if we're gonna which i'll come on to the next slide but if we're gonna change the document substantially we didn't want to press on with um certain kinds of editorial changes that might just get invalidated uh, the plan is to, to 
to continue addressing those based on the outcome of this meeting or subsequent discussion on the list. Um, so we're not going to forget that. Um, and I would presume maybe we probably need to do another working group call after all of this. Um, and if there's any more feedback or we missed something that we thought we had addressed, hopefully that will all come up again. Um, but yeah, we have this question about structured fields and we really need an answer and, and not to revisit the question, I think. So if you go on to the next slide, um, just, just to give you a feel for what where we're at for that document, um, we have the editor's copy, uh, which is draft 07, the last formal release, plus, plus all the edits I mentioned. Um, we haven't cut an 08 with those because of this kind of pending question. Uh, if we if we decide kind of to stick with how things are, we'll finish up the editorials and just publish and, and away we go. Uh, but um, might not be that yet. Uh, but but just to give you a recap of, of the, the headers that are in that document, none of the other stuff, but you know, we have uh, effectively four defined headers now. Uh, we have digest and con uh, Digest and Want Digest, which were originally in RFC 3230. Um, and we have these new headers that we added after some of the working group discussion before, which are called Content Digest and Want Content Digest. Um, and these things achieve similar but slightly different um, goals. And we talk about where they might be more useful for one purpose or another. Uh, but the, the thing I want to focus on here is that they use the same syntax. They use this hash rule that uh, is defined in one of the documents. I, I forget which one now. Um, but but that's how RFC 3230 did it. Um, and we stuck with that for digest. And when we added a new content digest, we stuck with that format because it's the same. And having two headers that do almost the same thing in a different syntax would just be weird. Um, so we didn't want to do that, even though it might have been the more slightly correct thing to do. Um, and you know we have effectively a list of key value pairs where the key is a digest algorithm, um, which is a token, uh, and the value is uh, a, a checksum output, which isn't necessarily always base sixty four. It is for things like SHA two five six or five twelve, but um, there's there's other algorithms like uh, CRC uh, that that use something else. Um, so that's how it was. It's kind of it's kind of a bit annoying. Um, uh, and this format isn't compatible with structured fields. I did an exercise just to see if we could, a bit like Mark's retroactive um, structured fields, and to see if if there'd be a way to maybe just hope that they fitted in. Um, but it was like a square peg in a round hole. It's very close, but things like token for the digest algorithm, um, or um, or the the, the 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 various characters that might be in the checks and output could mean that you have 90% of cases pass and then the odd one that would fail and just be dropped by a structured field parser. And that seemed uh, very bad. So <laughs> this is this is currently where we're at. Um, if we go into the next slide. Look, um, you know, we, we had this question about structured fields. Is there some way, given the constraints that we have, that we could consider uh, structured fields basically. I've explained why we can't just kind of shoehorn them in. Um, um, so so if we have to discount that option, what other options do, do we think that are left? Um, the, the first one here is just like stick with what we're doing. The, the original goal of this document was to they digest and want digest, make make the explanation of how they apply to HTTP semantics align with the terminology of semantics and, and hopefully make it clearer for people how to actually use the header as it was intended. Um, people still seem to get confused about representation versus content, et cetera, but it's it's not our job to you know define the entire world here. There's other documents that define those terminology consistently and more clearly, and we should just try to use them as possible. Um, but we don't want to break things either. So we, we keep that legacy list format. We deprecated a few things that we don't think people actually use. We don't have evidence for, but by and large, if if you just keep on sending digests, it should work. And there's some use cases that we have on a, a couple of slides later that we can talk through. Um, 
But if we did want to stick with that option, what else could we consider here? Um, so option two, so called three headers, would allow us to continue using a legacy format for digest and want digest. We'd update the terminology. We'd say, you know, digest applies to representations and um, yeah, this is what it looks like. Uh, but we define two two new headers plus plus the the want equivalents of them. Um, so really, it's more than three, but it's easier to talk about three. Um, but what we'd have is is a representation digest, which is a structured field that does exactly the same thing as digest wants to do, um, except it uses the structured fields format. Basically, we we talk about the concept of of what a representation is and what the digest of a representation is and how it works across you know things like partial responses etc or head requests like we just talked about um and then say there's effectively two ways to um serialize this onto the wire and you know there you go you need a different serializer and parser for that bit but after you've taken it off the wire you treat them the same um, a content digest would would be the same um same with the want headers state the, the functionality there wouldn't be different just the way it looks on the wire um and then there's an option three which i call two headers which is basically pretend that digest is is kind of um toxic <laughs> or it's not worth spending any more effort trying to update it if we're going to define two new headers that can effectively supplant what it does anyway um so we, we we basically don't try to do anything, any treatment to digest and want digest. If if you are using a, a, some mechanism like this already, and you want to use structured fields, just move to this new header that we're going to define called representation digest. And if if you find out that actually using it wrong, and, and what you're trying to do was provide the 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 integrity check for the message content, then there's also content digest too. Um, Editorially, this is kind of simpler to reason about, um, but it's it's not that there is a wrinkle in terms of how we do a treatment of the IANA table and the digest algorithms and, and stuff like that. So although the, the kind of straw person PRs I've put up tries not to touch 3230 at all, um, it's, it's not completely isolated. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, please. Um, Let's try and think. Yeah, just just to dive into into these a little bit. Um, you know, here's a link to the PR and a, and a textual diff, uh, which make might make it easier to, for people to review. I won't ask them to do that right now because <laughs> because we're we're in the meeting. Um, but uh, yeah, it does what I just said. The the format I think looking at what we have today in that list syntax um, and. Uh, uh, kind of like what a good structured fields header might be. Yeah, it's bike shedding a little bit, but you know we've only got a few options in structured fields, which is nice. And I don't think it'd be too hard to pick pick them um, if we're going to go with either option two or three. That's something that we need the working group to help us to decide on. Um, but yeah, the the structured dictionary would help here um, for for those two fields and a list for the want representation digest or want content digest. Um, and we'd, we'd have this Q parameter that we would define as well on top of that. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, Op option three is like to accept easier. So same, same problems if we decide to go with it that we would need some working group input to address, but nothing more to say. Next slide. Um, so, so this looks like a mess of a slide. I did it on purpose uh, because I've got a better one on the next slide. Uh, but you can see, you know, if you want to scan that and say, well, currently it looks like this. And then, you know, if we did some of the changes that we're talking about here, um, it would look like that. If you go to the next slide, it makes the, the comparison a lot easier. But effectively, the, the main difference on the wire would just be an in, insertion of some colons like around the, the binary representation of, of the checksum. Obviously, this is an oversimplification because I, I said earlier, some of the algorithms you might pick currently uh, state that the encoded output isn't in base64. 
Uh, but uh, one suggestion here would be to say for these new headers, everything is SF binary, everything is base64 encoded. Um, that feels cleaner to me uh, rather than making you know, exceptions or branching codes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I just think we should just pick pick one of these and, and move on. Um, I have a personal view on this, but as the editor, it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm trying not to express it. Uh, we talked to, you know, in the between Roberto and I and, and, and Justin a bit in the back channel about maybe, you know, what 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 could be done, and and that's led to where we got to now with these options. Um, we've we've seen some feedback on the list about what people would like. Uh, I think there's kind of an initial sway towards two because it it does everything. Uh, it it achieves everything we wanted and more, um, which is great. Except it it might require even more work, and that we need the support. I think just to make sure that we're not, you know. Um, yeah, we're not throwing away things, but in terms of the editorial nature about how we introduce a concept that applies to two different serializations and just making sure that the draft is comprehensible um, to people who haven't been so deeply involved in the process and that we can actually get it out through the IESG without it coming back to us or something horrible like that. So um, Roberto kindly prepared this table to give us a kind of Overview comparison of the two. Um, oh, sorry, of the three. Um, yeah, I don't know if that that helps people. Um, so, do you want to open discussion, Lucas? Uh, can we you, just you have some people in do queue? You wanna, do you want to keep on uh, doing the slides? No, let, let, um, there's some people in the queue. Let's let's take some questions now. Uh, okay. There's not really th this is all there is to talk about on the topic. So, any other slides are just going to kind of deviate around and we might answer the question or whatever. All right, um, Julian. So first of all, thanks a lot for actually making these two options available to us to, to look at. Um, I think the idea of having a consistent naming of the fields like um, content digest and representation digest is uh, and the one, one fields um, for them is great because it will make it for people coming new to this much easier to understand what this is about. So um, I, I think it, it's really clear that, uh, and, and the other thing is, if we can switch to structured fields, that's a great plus. So um, <clears throat> that being said, um, option two, as you said, is the gives us everything. And while option three is the more minimal approach. And when I sent my feedback to the email, I actually didn't look so closely at option three. But I think that um, you as authors who are most familiar with existing users of the old fields will have to think about it. Question is, is there so much existing usage of that old field name that it's really important to preserve that work? Because otherwise option three seems like a much simpler spec, right? Yeah. Um, just, just to respond to that, thanks, Julian. I think, you know, I, I said I didn't want to express a bias. Um, Martin in the chat um, said, that, you know, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Sorry. Um, I think, yeah, Julian just got to the crux of the issue there. I'm not so invested in the implementation perspective to worry about old digest. You know, I, I could just ignore it and, and just say, let's use the new thing. Um, and it's really, if if we... If we were to even update digest, even if we just went with option one, who who would care? Like if you got an extant implementation, just to, you would ignore it anyway. Like it doesn't matter how how well we explain things, you're going to do it wrong. Um, so to me, like option three seemed the clearest thing. But then you know, Roberto has a very good points that you know, maybe people do want to update, and maybe they would realize that actually that what they've been doing was wrong and, and they'd be willing to get more compliant. And if we if we don't ever, having gone to the effort of trying to um, wrangle 
the new semantics into this old digest. If we never go back and correct that, do we just leave people in this weird limbo thing where they don't really understand what, and they'll just ignore the new stuff as well? So um, option two seems like a compromise, and I think we could make it work. And it's none of these headers are too different from each other either. Uh, but that's just that's just my opinion. Um, I, 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 should we continue with the queue? Yeah, let's do that. Um, Annabelle. Hi. So the the thing that comes to mind for me for option two versus option three is if people using the existing headers today make no code changes, do they gain anything from option two? I'm seeing a, a shaking of a head, is, so that's a that's a no. They're, they would have to make code changes to take advantage of the the changes, the update to thirty two thirty. Correct. I don't know, if, Roberto. We want to maybe answer that question. And I'll, I'll I'll go to the next step of it, and that's. If if I have to make code changes to take advantage of updates to 3230, why wouldn't I just make code changes to use the new header fields? Um, yeah. yeah um, I, I got to take those as rhetorical questions, Annabelle. Sure. I think that, that's kind of the... the <laughs> The, the same kind of Hello? questions I've been asking. Like, if if you're not gonna, if like, we're not changing how how digests work unless you were doing it wrong initially. And hopefully, the new the new way of describing these things using HTTP semantics right. should make that clearer. If if people are see there's a a thing, you know, an update to a header they already use and they read it and go, oh no, I've been using this wrong all the time. But but from the protocol perspective, there's not really anything to change. What you would change is like the input that you put, you, you run your digest algorithm over and the value would be different, but it would look exactly. the same otherwise. Yeah. Exactly. Now, yeah, so go on, Roberto. The point here is that there is a wide ecosystem using digest, especially in public sector, banking sector, um, ecosystem and uh, being the, those ecosystem regulated the point for the users is that until RFC 3230 stands for the way of reasoning of those ecosystem this is valid and they should not change neither the input neither the syntax so my work with uh, digest started when i noted that in those regulated ecosystem api providers were doing it wrong and uh, when i when i explain this to them everything that the regulated system was interested in was that the specification is not clear so we are not sure we are wrong because we don't do not understand all these http semantics whatever and they started to open the uh, and listen to me only after this process of draft started. Uh, it's sad, but this is how public banking sector uh, usually work in the sense that there is a very uh, slow process of changing stuff and uh, it is important, in my opinion, to update 3230 so that they can be aware that there is an issue in the implementation. And since we introduce new header, we have a way to push 
for an immigration to uh, the new fields using structured fields. But until we do not uh, update 3230, uh, the way of reasoning of this kind of environment will, uh, um, will, they will not be aware that there is an issue in what they are doing. And they will continue providing services without taking care of the HTTP semantics. Well, wouldn't we be obsoleting 3230? That's a change. I mean, if you're going to notice a, a, an update to an RFC, you'd presumably notice it being obsoleted. But I, I, I'm a little concerned about that line of reasoning because it feels like using the RFC editorial process for CVEs. <laughs> um, I, 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 at the same time, I, I, I'm sympathetic to the use case here. And I think the question, the real ultimate question I have is, is would those users of the existing headers uh, be able to and want to adopt the new headers? And, and and if not, you know what what's what's the blocker there? And I think that's that's where I'll leave off on on my my questioning. All right, let's get through some more of the queue. Um, Justin, you're up next. Uh, yeah, so um, I just wanted to add that um, I, I've gone through uh, this in my head a few times, and I keep coming back to option two. I know that it is more work. Um, as as a fellow editor in this working group, I absolutely understand that. Um, even so, um, I see the value in uh, what Roberto is saying about updating the uh, semantics and the clarity about 3230, having implemented 3230 a number of times now on different platforms. It is absolutely not clear as to what is going on. So much so that when I took an experiment um, a few weeks ago, a month ago or so, to try out this uh, using structured fields for Content Digest. Only then did I realize that I have probably been implementing Digest wrong my entire life, um, specifically the way that I was processing the encoding, um, at least in the implementation that I went to go, uh, that I went to go poke this, I realized that I was, um, uh, I was not encoding things properly. So just, the very small layer of relying on SF binary for those binary values and having that be just a single way to encode things immediately removed uh, a couple of bugs from my own code. Now, I was also in the case where I was writing both the generator and the verifier for the digest. So I made the mistake on both sides and the system worked just fine. I honestly think that that is happening a lot out there uh with with specs like this because you don't have built-in support for di uh, digest calculation in a lot of http uh, stacks right there's no just turn on digest and it'll it'll just work at least not today um so i think a lot of people are building it on both sides and making the same mistakes on both sides a lot like i did so strong strong support for me for uh introducing structured fields so either option two or three are the most sensible for me um i personally kind of don't care what happens with legacy digest but i believe roberto's plea for having that be more clear for the people that do need to keep using the legacy format and i think that what lucas has done in uh, in the existing pr is uh just uh, quite frankly, masterfully skates that line of saying this is, you know, we're not changing the syntax of the old thing, but we're telling you how you're doing it wrong. And by the way, here's these new things that are much easier to uh, validate um, because you're using structured fields. So strong support for option two. Okay. Mark? Yeah, so just personally, I, I don't have strong feelings about this. I'm, I'm happy to go with whatever the working group wants to do, but I'm concerned about option two in that it, it feels like we're going to be sending a potentially confusing signal 
uh, uh, people will come to the spec and they'll see both and some will choose one and some will choose the other. And that can harm interop. And, and, and I, I, I tend to think when we think about things that we publish, we should be thinking in the long term, not, not in terms of short term pain. Um, and, and so, you know, yes, obsoluting digest is, is, is perhaps painful for some, but it sends a very clear, uh, sorry, 3230 obsoluting, obsoluting 3230, uh, it's painful, but it sends a clear signal. And we've certainly been in situations before when people are still using something and the ITF sends a fairly clear signal that we're not going to, we don't recommend using that anymore. And we understand that people will still use it for a while after that, potentially years. Um, but but more than anything, I want us to send a really clear signal. So to, to me that, you know, in addition to the issues that Annabelle brings up, and, and I'm, I'm also concerned that if, if we have two different, you know, uh, or, or rather an updated de definition of digest with, with potentially different semantics or interpretation, as Justin was saying, that, that you know, it, it's possible to implement in a different way, uh, that's going to cause potential interrupt problems as well, because you're not clear whether the, your peer is uh, paying attention to the update or not. But, but so, so my preference is, I think, option three. Uh, if we stick with option two, all that I ask is, is that we find a way to very clearly recommend the newer things and to uh, make the, the text about digest as incidental as possible. And maybe one way to do that would be to put it into an appendix um, so that it's clear. This is just, if you still have to use digest, look at this bit over here. Yeah, just to quickly respond, I think from an editorial perspective, like we could we could do that. The the, the way I've, I've crafted it is to try and talk about you know, representations and it, and when you digest them, the content stuff is easy. It doesn't need any more consideration. But you take the bytes in the message and you hash them. The, the representation is the difficult thing, and it needs to be talked to either anyway for the representation digest header too. So we, we I don't think it'd be too difficult to do that. But I, I, and I see Julian as well made a comment. Like my, my concern is, you, you have two headers that can do almost the same thing, and there's no reason why both of them wouldn't be sent. But maybe, I don't know, they're generated by some other system, and they're just passed through and then added on. And and it's in, it's unclear if digest is meant to apply to the representation or the content. And then we also need to talk about what endpoints should do if they see both and need to pick one to to validate or not. It's already hard enough when there's multiple algorithms that might apply and trying to explain. So that there's additional things in option two that we need to speak to um, by supporting all three of these. And, and the PRs don't do that yet. That, so that's another concern for me. Fair enough. Uh, also, real quick, Representation Digest is an awfully long field name. I agree with that. Suggestions welcome. <laughs> Um, Roberto, you'd already commented a bit. I think Martin's the next person in queue who hasn't spoken yet. Unless, <laughs> unless uh, Roberto has something that hasn't been said yet. Um, I would, I was originally sort of mildly in favor of option two. Um, but then I realized a couple of things in this conversation and I think I'm, I'm like Mark leaning toward option three as well. Um, the. The thing that kind of clinches it for me is this sort of knowledge we now have of the fact that a lot of people have implemented digest incorrectly for whatever incorrectly means, um, in, inconsistent with the definition that was imagined by the authors of the specification, um, might be the way to put it. So I would say option three, um, I like the idea of the appendix saying, this is why we obsoleted digest. If you really have to keep using it, then then this is what was intended, but um, here are the risks. Uh, that That's a pretty nice way of, of slicing this one. So um, I was originally, uh, well, let, let the let the editors decide, but no, I'm, I'm on option three now. Okay, I see a bunch of comments in the chat that are supporting option three with appendix and updating or obsoleting the original draft. If folks haven't spoken yet and they just want to give a, you know, something in chat or, or through some of the, or, or speak briefly, it'd help us gather information from, from more folks. It's, as I said, we can't hum. 
Well, I think that uh, in uh, in any case, uh, RFC thirty two thirty should, uh, if we decide to just uh, leave the two structure fields header, uh, the old digest should be deprecated. The thing that I want to point out is that the fact that we just deprecate uh, abruptly digest uh, doesn't mean that the wise uh, ecosystem using it will uh, just switch to the new fields. On the other side, the feelings could be that they will just ignore this specification since it doesn't, uh, they could see that this specification is not at all related to digest. So this is something that mm, I would like to point out. Clearly, I'd be very happy if everybody would switch to the new structure fields header. The point is that which is the best strategy for the actual ecosystem to make this happen? Leaving the floor under their feet so and say, okay, uh, you are uh, 1,000 banks and 23 countries using digest, but you are wrong. And now you should uh, use these two other couple of fields. Or, okay, uh, we made some reasoning. You should do this uh, to implement it in the correct way. And uh, if you want to benefit of structured fields, you could take some time to modify your regulated environment and switch fields after you in your ecosystem all agree on the new spec. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Roberto, I think, you know, what I hear people suggesting as far as, you know, an option three that obsoletes or updates the old RFC and has an appendix that says, hey, if you're using digest, this is what it was supposed to mean. I, I get the impression that, you know, people are sympathetic to making sure it's clear to people how they can migrate. And I think obviously no one's going to get rid of all of their digest headers immediately. Um, but I guess just, just to you before we go to the rest of the queue, like could you live with option three with a good appendix that was trying to address um, this audience that you were concerned about? Excuse me, could you please repeat the last part of the question? Could, could you live with essentially the proposal that a lot of people are saying of an option three that obsoletes the old document, but has an appendix or like, you know, maybe even in the introduction, like tells you, hey, if you're using the old header and you wanna understand what to do, go read this blurb. Would that be something you could live with? Well, <laughs> it, uh, it's a very hard question uh, because all, all this work started by, I was trying to fix digest for them. Uh, I work for um, <laughs> a government agency. <laughs> so my, my goal and everything started because I wanted to fix digest. Uh, but if there is a, a strong opinion on from from the world group uh, well uh, i will try to <laughs> to motivate this <laughs> in some way uh, clearly i'm i'm generally a lean for, on option 2 <laughs> okay um i think the, we're we're pretty much out of time but um justin you are also in queue just wanted to hear from you yeah, just really quick, uh, the way I'm hearing people talk about option three is kind of how I was thinking about option two to begin with, uh, is, and uh, which is, you know, a very light touch of saying, by the way, digest, uh, 
is is the same thing, but using this legacy format and then just move on with the day. So if that gets uh, sort of collected into an appendix uh, and or introductory blurb, if you want to call that option two or three or two and a half, I you know I I, I don't care. But that's uh, that's how I was always seeing option two anyway. So how people are talking about option three now with this little blurb of oh by the way digest and thirty two thirty exists. Here's what that means. Um, that's I'm absolutely on board with that. And to be clear, if the working group does go with option three, for my applications, it actually doesn't matter because I just want content digest with structured fields and I, I kind of don't care about anything else, but I know <laughs> people do. Okay. All right. Um, thanks everyone for the good discussion. There are, sorry, Tommy, there, there are like two things that come out of, of, of option two or three. This, okay. and it, the thing I get is, is we're going to go in that direction. Um, yeah. Oh, yep. we don't have the time for that right now. That's fine. But just to let people know, like the things that worry me, just are, blast through them. <laughs> there's, um, we don't even need to look at the slides. One is about defining a new Q parameter, which is going to basically copy what Q value is in HTTP semantics. Do we want to define a common way to do Q parameters for any structured field? Um, like doing it everywhere seems like a waste. We, we can decide that later on, but that, that's something that's ticking over in our brains. And the other one is about IANA. Um, like, do we go with the same table and try and update it to support the different legal characters that are allowed in algorithm tokens? Or do we just leave the old table for old digests and create a new table for, for the new headers? Uh, again, I don't think that's something I can answer right now, but it will need an answer before this work is complete. Mm -hmm. I think that latter question is really interesting because it's going to come up if we do the retrofit work as well. Yep. Okay. I think this is definitely a useful discussion. Um, Mark, I mean, we can talk more about specifically, but it, it seems like we do have um, a good indication of the working group's feelings. I think so. And of course, we'll have to talk and, and take it to the list to, to be sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Lucas and, and Roberto. Uh, next up, we have cookies. Stephen. Stephen Bingler, Google, um, 6265 BIS janitor. Um, so I'll be going over uh, the status of 6265 BIS since the last time we spoke about it. Uh, as well as talk about <clears throat> our current issues and, and what's stopping us from, from finishing this. Uh, I'll kind of fly through these slides to leave as much time for discussion as possible. Next slide, please. So what's happened since last time? We've published the 09 draft. Uh, in that draft, we've updated cookie size requirements to add a name plus value size limit of 4096 and a per attribute size limit of 1024. Uh, previously, the entire cookie line was was computed as a size limit. Uh, we found this to be a little bit more useful. Uh, we are rejecting cookies with control characters instead of truncating. Uh, the list of control characters is is there, and we have specified what an empty domain should how an empty domain should be handled. Uh, these are cookies where <clears throat> the attribute is domain equals. Uh, and these are to be set as host only. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, recent changes since 09 that haven't been published yet. Uh, we've worked to standardize the maximum expires slash max age attribute. Uh, essentially, we will clamp the max age down to 400 days. And then there's been a number of editorial changes. Next slide. Uh, current issue statuses. Uh, so I have 12 written here. In between the time I've I made these slides and now, one of those have been closed. So this is now 11 open issues. Uh, we have a number of them with scope and then one of them that I think we can probably end up deferring uh, to add to the list of 12 deferred issues. Uh, for anyone unaware, these are issues that we want to tackle, but we think are out of scope for 6265 BIS and they'll be deferred to the next document. Next slide, please. Uh, so quickly, just kind of clarifying the open issues types of work. We have 
two broad categories as I see it. Uh, a number of issues that are trying to clarify specific behavior within the doc. Uh, this is um, stricter set cookie parsing head, um, algorithm, ID and name support, handling trailing dots and domain attributes, max age handling, and then a number of other attributes. I won't read through them all uh, that are adding some note about how specific situations should or should not be handled. And then next slide, please. Uh, there is one issue that I think we can probably end up deferring. Um, the spec isn't clear on how to handle when the public suffix list changes, which can cause a number of issues with cookies. We kind of have an outstanding idea to just add a note saying that browsers should be careful not to send invalid cookies, but we'll, but I think we should probably defer this to the next document on how we want to handle that specifically. Oh, uh, previous slide, please. I meant to say this. Uh, let's see, uh, 1517 on there is the one that has been recently closed. Uh, no, de no decoding of the set cookie header is no longer, no longer open. Okay, so that's it for the update and I'd like to open, open up for discussion. filter out the ones that are deferred. Thanks for that. Uh, so anybody have any specific things they want to bring up? Any questions? Or did, Stephen, did you want to go over any of the issues? Or John, hi John. Uh, I wanted to see if anybody had any particular issues they wanted to go over. Otherwise, we could kind of work through them one by one if that would be more preferable. Sure. Let me... Yeah. And if we could uh, zoom in a little bit too, that'd be lovely. <clears throat> How's that? Good. Uh, uh, Justin was in queue. Yeah, not not for discussion on this call, but uh, the signature editors uh, could use a hand figuring out semantics for signing cookies beyond just signing the raw header value. Um, we feel that there is something there. It was something that we discussed in uh, at IETF one twelve, and quite frankly, um, neither of us are. are quite deep enough experts to probably get this right at the first shot. So any any help and crossover as especially as we're updating the the definitions of both cookie and set cookie um that uh any help with that uh would be greatly appreciated. And again, we don't have to have that conversation on this call because I think uh you know some so either something on the list or something uh something uh offline. Yeah, that sounds good. If you want to file an issue and sort of tag me in it, uh, we can. <clears throat> I can help you out with that later. Um, okay, we have issues filed against signatures, so I will. Uh, I will tag you on those. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. All right, uh, Martin. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to request that we do seventeen oh seven. This page is an eye chart, but it's. Um, <laughs> That that's one that Johan did a little bit of work on recently, and I think there's something that we could probably add to maybe resolve it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'll just say something. Hi everyone. Sorry, I'm just coming off a cold, and I have a really terrible voice. But um, my name's Johan, and I work on Chrome. And um, I did some work on this and added some tests for. Um, seeing how browsers behave with uh, both UTF-8 bytes and Punicode. <clears throat> and so I guess the TLDR is uh, only Chrome supports uh, UTF-8 bytes uh, and parses them correctly. And Firefox will reject and Safari will just uh, ignore the domain attribute. Oh, to be clear, this is only in the domain attribute. So this is not for the entire cookie header. It's just for the domain attribute. And yeah, I, I guess Martin had concerns about this and I was interested in hearing about it. <clears throat> yeah, so the the question of what to do with um, non-ASCII characters in header fields is, is one that we've come back to again and again in, in this. My understanding is that at the current time, 
we define HTTP as carrying octets. But the, the use of octets, outside, the, the values of octets outside of the ASCII range is risky, um, to say the least. Um, they don't compress very well when we put ahead of compression stuff. They don't make it through certain intermediaries and implementations, and um, they cause interesting and surprising problems of exactly the sort that you identified. You know, Firefox says, no, nope, this is no good. Um, and apparently Safari does something like ignoring the attribute, which is a little weird, um, probably a bug. Um, but um, it's my sense that probably the best way to deal with this is to recommend that we use A labels. Is Did your tests show that the A labels were reasonably good? Sorry, A labels means Punicode. Punicode, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I don't think I can I can make it more comprehensive for testing, but like the basic Punicode, the Punicode tests were fine. And and so if specifically, I think I I didn't see it in the test that you wrote up, but if you have an IDN name um, and you use the domain attribute and refer to that using the punicode D does that mean that if you if you subsequently connect to that host that cookie would be sent uh, i didn't see that in the test very clearly but i'm i'd only just skimmed it as a on top level you mean like a top level navigation to that host um where like i think yeah i think i, I can i guess that will mean that, yes. Uh, so you do a request. I mean, I guess, you know, it's and the browser is translated to Punicode in any way, right? So. Um, For the DNS query, yes. The, the question is whether or not the, the domain attribute written as Punicode matches up with the the name such that the mm -hmm. browser will actually use that cookie when it, when it subsequently connects to that name. Yeah, I think the browser internally, like in the way that it handles these URLs, like they're all converted to Punicode. So, and that's what fails in Firefox, right? Like it tries to convert. When we try to uh, parse UTF-8 bytes, like it doesn't, it tries to compare those, uh, you know, that UTF-8 to Punicode and that just fails. Okay. So internally it's all Punicode, so I think that should work. Yeah. Okay. That being the case, we have a solution to ensure that um, IDN names are properly treated. We just don't have consistency on the UTF-8 side of things. So my recommendation would be to recommend the use of uh, A labels or Punicode and recommend against the UTF-8 thing and, and even to the point of forbidding it. Um, assuming that's acceptable to, to folks who have implemented it um, and those who have bugs. You say prohibit, do you mean uh, reject cookies that contain a domain with Unicode? Uh, yeah, I would say that's probably the right way to do it. Yeah. So that, that particular atom, that particular cookie name value pair would, would be rejected and ignored. Yeah, I think it's good to be explicit about that, right? Because I don't think we should do what Safari does and and accept the cookie. I think it should be rejected. Yeah, there's there's probably a few little things that need to be uh, clarified, but this this sort of goes back to the thing that Stephen was talking about earlier in terms of um, constraining the list of octets that can appear in names and values. We would also make a similar sort of um, restriction on the on the domain which could be a little tighter than what you had there, I think. Makes sense to everyone. Uh, perhaps Martin, could you, when you get a chance, update the issue with a comment that summarizes what you think, you know, the way forward is and, and mention that we discussed it today so we don't lose state. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, just one more comment. I think uh, generally I would defer to Stephen as as the cookie owner of, uh, on Chrome side on this bit. But um, I was also going to add tests um, metrics into Chrome that check for the existence of non ASCII attributes and non ASCII characters. Um, and depending on how those go, I guess that also informs our decision. <clears throat> I'm generally in line with Martin, especially given his reasoning with <clears throat> sort of intermediaries, proxies, and other other fun things that probably <clears throat> don't explicitly handle this. Uh, it seems fine to me to disallow Unicode characters. Um, while the conversation was happening, I just checked with kind of what Chrome was doing by visiting a website real quick. And it looks like we do convert everything to Punicode and we just handle it in that space. So this would be easy enough from our end, um, but <clears throat> I will, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, I can comment on the issue as well once Martin puts down his thoughts. Okay, uh, any other issues that folks wanna speak to? Or that the editors want to bring up for for discussion. If not, we've got about fifteen minutes. So, I guess um, if we're not going to go through any issues. I have a just a broad question to the editors on kind of scheduling for closing these out and what that sure. would be like. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> I have a personal um, personal schedule of devoting a little bit more time to these within the next month or two, okay. especially for some of the the more low hanging fruit. Um, adding note, um, Johan has also expressed some interest in picking up. Um, some of these issues as well and, and helping to close them out. So I'm feeling optimistic that we can we can whittle this list down pretty significantly within the next couple of months. And I got a thumbs up from you on there. So glad I'm not putting words in his mouth. Hi there. Uh... Uh, maybe I should re reveal myself too here. Uh, John Willander from Apple WebKit here, one of the co-editors. In, in reading up of, and, and thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for for this run through. Uh, in reading up of the, uh, some of the issues here uh, that are on screen, uh, the third party cookies one is of particular interest, and there was some back and forth there. So, I wanted to see, Mark, are you happy where that thing landed, or do you think we should work some more to get that language to be accurate and actually say what the situation is so speaking as as you know the per person making the proposal not as chair um yeah i i think the text is accurate now um I, I know there's been some pushback from from james on the pr i think yep uh but I, I and i've tried to talk with him and and he doesn't seem to actually want to engage on the text he just wants to make very broad general statements which uh i, I don't think are really actionable Mm -hmm. um, so if, if folks want to look at it, I, I, I think that this text is accurate, an accurate reflection of the current state of third party cookies. Yeah, uh, and without, if you scroll without, all the way down, I think that the expensive. last thing you say there in, 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 is kind of where it's at, right? Where you're saying, while this document does not endorse or require a specific approach, like, you know, that, that's where we're at. Yeah, I, th I think that, that, yeah, this is the only place where uh, it actually makes a recommendation. The rest is, is as far as I remember, a very descriptive text of, of the state of play. Um, and I think, you know, I think we're making this recommendation in my mind, both from an interoperability standpoint and also, of course, a privacy standpoint. That, that you know, people can't expect that third party cookies are going to work and that browsers need to be user agents and, and, and advocate for their users. If that's too strong, uh, let's talk about it. But I, I think, you know, we've had similar text in previous drafts and in, the, in, in previous RFCs. So I, I don't think they're, you know, they're, well, there's certainly precedent for it. Yep. Agreed on my part. Uh, 
I just wanted to say that I initially expressed sort of some ambivalence to whether this happened or not, but you've convinced me that this is this is an improvement. So thank you for working on that. So I guess from my perspective, feel free to merge this whenever the editors are comfortable. All right, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> are there any other issues that anybody's interested in that we can talk about? And, and 1385 was the one that you would, wanted to defer, correct? Correct. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah I, in fact, I was looking kind of at the the notes from the previous meeting, and I it seems like we wanted to defer this, and it it sort of just didn't happen. So I'll make a note to get that deferred after this. Oh, actually, um, on this one, I just wanted to double check. The the spec is relatively clear uh, that uh, attribute names are case insensitive uh, in, in in multiple places, um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, do we have any tests around that? Because, you know, the, it, they're capitalized so consistently in all the documentation and, and, and now all the examples that you see out in, in the world. I'm just wondering if, if, in fact, they are case insensitive in every instance. I hope they are, to be clear. I seem to recall some web platform tests that had um, weird casing, um, okay. <clears throat> but I'd feel better once I pulled those up and verified it. So don't okay. quote me quite yet. Right. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll dig around maybe and have a look uh, as well. I, I, I hadn't thought to do that before now. Um, th this issue is just maybe, um, I, if you're a seasoned spec reader, I think it, it's pretty obvious that they're case insensitive, but you do have to dig around a lot. And this is just asking, can we make it a little bit more explicit uh, in the syntax section so that, that they're case insensitive? I agree that's probably a worthwhile change. Um, as somebody who wasn't in this space until just a few years ago, um, <clears throat> I was just kind of thrown a spec and, and kind of told to understand it. And anything that, that helps somebody process it, I think is probably worthwhile. Okay, um, if nobody else has an issue, I think we're done for today. Sound good, Tommy? That sounds right. Thanks, good Stephen. All of you. Thanks to Stephen and Johan and John and, and all the other editors of that spec. Uh, Thank you. It seems like we're making really good progress on, on all three of those big meaty specs, which is good. Mm -hmm. And Lucas is back. Uh, so uh, we'll see everybody in about two days, and we'll talk about some of the smaller but just as important other specs. So thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Thanks to the note takers, too. Oh, yes, absolutely.